Vayar Bolok Ben Sipor. Es Kol Asher Osi Yisrael Lamori. Bolok the son of Sipor had seen all that Yisrael had done to the Amori. So Rashi over there cites the Chazal, the Midrash. Omar, Elushnei Melochim, Shoyinu, Betuchim Aleim. These two kings that we relied upon them, Lo Omdu Bifneim, could not stand before the Jewish people. They were both destroyed. Ono Alachas Kam Vakamo. So we, they were our protectors. They were not able to stand up against them. So we, there's no question, Therefore, they were, they, they withdrew, or they constricted. So we hear, the Balaturim cites it's the Medrash. Lelakek in Hebrew means to lick, to lap. Bolok, he, his level of disdain and hate for, for Klausha was he just wanted to lap up that blood. That's how intense his hate for the Jewish people were. Ben Sipor, Sho'of Aleim Kitzipor Lekalom. As a bird suddenly comes, a bird of prey comes upon its victim. In a moment, that's the way he wanted to immediately, without hesitation, have them cursed. It's like a person cannot tolerate someone for a moment. Soon enough is to, is, is is being too late. That's Bolak Ben Sipor. There's an interesting Medrash. The Medrash tells us, you know, in um, Shabbos, we say Kilolam Chasdo. We say 26 kilom chastos in Pesuka de Zimra. What is all this kilom chasto about? Dovin Amel said this. So the Medjitan Tchuma says that we find that after Kriyas Yamsuf, Moshe Rabbeinu said Shiro. The soul the Song of the Sea, what we read last week, when the mountains came together and then parted, and then the wellspring went up into the mountains and washed out the remains of the Amorites who were waiting to throw these boulders on the Klal Yisrael, they realized the miracle that Hashem had performed for them. They said, Shira, it was Hoshira Sabe'er, the song of the wellspring, the wellspring of Miriam. After the destruction of Sihan Og, Moshe Rabbeinu did not say Shiro. Did not say Shiro. Klausha did not say Shiro. It's not held against them, but Shiro had to be said. The miracle of what took place when Og and Sihan were destroyed, it should have been quantified, it should have been articulated in song. It was not. So, because Moshe did not say Shiro, Dovid HaMelech said Shiro. So the, that that we have, the Sichom El Chabori Kilom Chazdo, Ogmel Chaboshan, forever is Hashem's Chesed. This had to be said because since Moshe did not say Shiro, David said Shiro on behalf of Klal Yisrael. But imagine something interesting. He says to destroy Sichon and Og, it was more difficult than destroying Marcos Paro Bechelo, the chariot corps of. Paro and all his armies, it was more difficult to destroy Oak and Sicho, these two giants. That's how difficult it was to destroy them. So when Paro was destroyed through the sea, and we say, Marcus Paro Vechelo Yorvayom, he cast them into the sea. And the choices of his, of his chariot corps drowned in the Yamsuf. If he said Shira there, he should have said Shira here. Because to be able to take down Ogun and, and Sichon, 
was a greater feat, accomplishment than taking down, than destroying the Egyptian army at its chariot core. And because Moshe did not say Shiro, David had to say Shiro, because Shiro had to be said. It couldn't have gone not being articulated and realized what Hashem had done on our behalf. What does it mean? It was more difficult. You read this, the Gemara. You had two giants. And the Gemara in Brochus tells us how did he kill Og? Og had taken a mountain that was Yudbe's mill, 12 miles, and he lifted it up and he put it over his head. And the camp of Klausha was 12 by 12 miles. And he was just going to drop it on them. He would crush them in one. In one moment, what did Kodesh Baruch do? He went and he had ants. And when he carried the mountain, he carried the mountain on his head to support the weight of the mountain. Hashem sent ants and the ants ate around the mountain where his head was, where the weight was sitting on his head. And because the part of the mountain was weak around that area, all of a sudden his, his hand went into the mountain, and the mountain was stuck on his neck. And he couldn't get the mountain off his head, and he has a 12 by 12 mile mountain on his shoulders, and his head is stuck in the mountain. He's trying to pull it off. What does Hashem do? He performs a miracle that his teeth grow into the mountain like spikes, and he can't pull the mountain off his head. And when David and David says until him, Shine Rishoim Shibarto, you've broken the teeth of the Rishoim. So the Gemara says it should not be read Shibarto, but Shirivavto. You've caused the teeth of Rishoim to grow out. The teeth grew out. His teeth grew into the mountain. And because the teeth grew into the mountain, he couldn't pull, pull the mountain over his head. And as he was walking and stumbling, that's when Moshe made him kill him. He killed him. So the whole thing was it was a mess. It was a miracle. How Og was killed. Doesn't sound like it's like the splitting of the sea and so on and so forth. So what does it mean? That it was more difficult to destroy Og at Sichon in terms of Moshe Rabbeinu's vantage point, these two giants, than the destruction of the chariot corps and the armies of Paro. There's a Gemara in Nida which speaks about that one of the Amoroim came upon the thigh bone of Ogmel Chabosha, thigh bone. And it says the thigh bone itself was, I don't know how long, like a mile, two miles. And the Samora went into the thigh bone. It was like into a, into a, into a tunnel. And it was like endless. And Amasha over there explains that, you know, when we speak about in existence, we spoke about the nether forces, representation of evil in existence. Ogen and, and Sichon, in terms of who they were, they represented evil at a level which was even greater than Paro and his chariot core and whatever he represented. So we're not talking about the physical destruction of Ogen and, and Sichon wasn't just you destroy them physically. You had to deal with the their representation of the evil. You had to address the evil. And once you were able to negate that evil, then you were able to destroy them. So their representative of evil was even greater than the representation of Paro and his chariot corps and his armies. That's what it was. And therefore, it should have been quantified. It should have been articulated by Moshe. He did not. David had to Verbalize that. And that's It's interesting. So, but he said 26. He said 26 kilom chasdos. And the Gemara tells why 26. Because the 20, 26 generations until Kabbalah's Torah, that day Hashem maintained existence was purely chesed. So to articulate that, that reality that existence existed not because of their worthiness, but it was purely chesed Hashem. Therefore, David said 26 kilom chastos. But the question is, 
if we're saying he only said the Kilim Chasto, the Shiro, because Moshe did not say the Shiro, and he's coming to fill in that void, because it had to be stated, he should have, should have said, what do you have to go back to the first generation for 26 generations to speak about every one of those generations? And it, it, it culminated. Then we That's where it is. So I'm thinking while I'm speaking. What is exactly the objective and the purpose of existence? As we discuss, it's Kabbalah Satora. It's the Jewish people were the only nation who were qualified to receive the Torah. But ultimately, we should fulfill that Torah. The location of Avoda is Eretz Yisrael. We have to arrive in Eretz Yisrael to build the Beis Amigdosh. That was the ultimate, that was the objective. Until these two giants were destroyed, creation was not able to be met its purpose until that level of representation was removed, was negated, nullified, and only then, and this was the Trans-Jordan side, this is the cross they destroyed, we took over, we conquered the Trans-Jordan side of the Yardin, we crossed, then we conquered Eretz Yisrael. It, it ended with the destruction of the seven nations of Canaan. That was the conquest. But before we were able to go in, these two giants had to be eliminated. As a result of that, the objective, the continuum from the beginning of creation till its culmination, to be able to build the Mesa Migdosh, these two giants had to be taken out. Therefore, the first 26 generations were purely Chesed Hashem. That Shira had to be said. If they wouldn't have taken out, it all would have been naught. It would have fallen short of where it should have been. If a David said 26 kilo of chazdos to indicate the shira from the first moment until the destruction of Sichon and Oak for that reason. But the concept that they were more difficult is because what they represented. In terms of the evil versus the Kedusha, it was more difficult the opposition to Kedusha. What they opposed was greater than Paro and his chariot corps and his armies. That's the understanding. But we see something interesting. It had to be said. It had to be verbalized, had to be articulated. David articulated. We find, we mentioned him many times, that Chizkiyo Melchi Huda was such a tzaddik that when he became the king, his father was, was an idolater. He gave an ultimatum to Klal Yisrael. And he gathered them, and he took a safe authority, he took a sword, and he gave an ultimatum. Either you live by the Torah, or you're going to appear, be pierced by the sword. After two and a half years, every woman and child were, were proficient in the laws of Tum Vatara, in the laws of spiritual purity. That's the level of impact he had. Jews were learning, studying day and night, and even the, the grapes on the vine rotted. That's at, to the degree that they esteemed and they valued Torah. The material took the back, the back, the back burner, the back seat. And because he was such a tzaddik, Hashem wanted that when Sancheriv, who had conquered the world supreme, when he came to destroy Yushlaim and the Besamigdosh, and he was going to be destroyed, and he was destroyed in one swoop by Gavriel at midnight, that Chizkyo should be the Mashiach. And Sadhir should be Gogo Mogo. And this should be the end of time. And the world should reach its level of perfection this moment, and all evil will be expunged from existence. That's what Hashem wanted. That's Chizkiyo Melchi Yehuda would be the Mashiach. So the Mara says, Midas Adin comes and says to HaKadosh Baruch Hu, he's not qualified. So Hashem says, why? But it's the Midas Adin. It's the exactness of Din, because after the destruction of Sancheriv, Chizkiyo should have said Shiro. And because he did not say Shiro, he's not worthy of being Mashiach. That's what he should have said. That would have capped it off. So what do we see from there? And you know what happened? Coach Bull says, if that's the case, 
Chizkiyo Melchiyot will not be Mashiach. And Sancher will not be Gogol Logo. It's going, to, it's going to be an event in the future. That's what happened. But what do we see over here? That if such an event takes place, such a monumental event, it's more than moving mountains. It has to be articulated, it has to be verbalized. And that's why David had to do what he did because Moshe Rabbeinu did not do that. Sichon Amori, Sichon and Og, as we said, to take them down was more difficult than taking down Makros Paro Vachelo, Chariot Corps Paro and all his armies. So there was a story recently, there was a Rosh Hashiv in Eretz Yisrael, he was 88 years old, his name, was Rav Kush, his name is Rav Kushalevsky, and he had a child. It was world news. His wife, it was a second marriage, he was married to his first wife 50 years, never had children. Married his second wife. She was a widow. She had two children of her own. At the age of 57, he was 88. And he had a, a little boy. And there was a bris, tremendous simcha. Now, how did this come about? So, when he married his second wife, the one who officiated his wedding, his name is Moshe Sternbach. Moshe Sternbach is from the famous Sternbach family and it comes originally from Switzerland. He grew up in England, then he came to Eretz Yisrael, and he was mentored by all the Gedolei Torah, all the leading Torah sages at the time. And he's 98 years old, this person. And he gave him a brocha. So he's married. He's 90. He was married to this woman for seven years. So he's Seven years earlier, he gave a bracha to Zerav Kushalevsky that he will have a child, that he, sh he should have a child. And he had the child. So after the child was born, he came to thank him. He came to thank him for the bracha because Hashem performed the miracle. That, you know, relatively speaking, it's unheard of. A man this age and a woman that age should be able to have a child. She should conceive from him. From him and it was a healthy child. So Rabbi Sternbach says to Rav Kushalevsky, I heard it on tape, he says, you're not supposed to come to thank me. When Hashem performs a miracle, the value of a miracle is to give thanks and make it public knowledge that Hashem performed the miracle. That's the value of this. It's not come to me. You should address Hashem, thank you, and make it public knowledge what Hashem did for you. So basically what he was saying to him, if when Hashem performs such a thing, it's time for Shira. You have to say shir. It has to be quantified. It has to be verbalized. And if you don't, you're falling short of what you're supposed to bring about. This is the understanding. Dov, Moshe did not say shira by Ogin and, and Sichon. David had to say shira. And that's the 26th. Yeah, and it was. So therefore he compensated for what Moshe did not do. Chizkyu, this is the end of the this is the end of time. It's, he does it, or it's not going to be done. Therefore, Midas Adin says, if that's the case, because he did not verbalize and quantify what happened, he doesn't qualify to be Mashiach. And factually, we're still waiting. Interesting, interest, you know. Hashem said to us, when you go into Canaan, you're going to find. A land which is Eretz Zavos Cholim Vosh, a land which flows with milk and honey, uh, a land which is Batim Malayim Kol Tuf. The houses will be filled with all bounty, everything that you can imagine, which is good, treasures, everything. So, what did the Canaanim do when they heard the Jews left Egypt and they're coming? They went and they did scorched earth. They destroyed everything. They burnt down the houses. They buried the treasures and they cut down the vineyards and they burnt their fields. That when the Jews come in, they're going to find a land that's totally destroyed. So what happens? Hashem says, look, I promised my children. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to give them a challenge which I know they're going to fail which was the Chet Ragnim, and they failed. And we were way late for 40 years. What do you think What, what do you think went through with the minds of the Canaanim? They said, we're a bunch of fools. 
Here we thought they were coming. We destroyed everything. And they're not coming. So we're in a safe place. And maybe they're not, they're not coming at all. So they replanted. They rebuilt. And everything was restored to the way it was originally. Now we're ready for real time. Klaus is coming again. This is Vayar Bolog. When Sichan and Ovid destroyed, they, they understood. Now they're coming. So now they had a question. Should we repeat what we did in the past? Destroy everything again. They said, you know something? We're only going to make that mistake once. We're not going to do it again. Because maybe at the last moment, they may be way late again. You know, we'll do whatever we can to fight them to, to prevent them from entering. And that's why they commissioned Bullock. Bullock commissioned Billum. But ultimately, when we came in, we found everything was restored. It was Eretzovitz Cholot Vosh. So as much as they were scared out of the wits, it's not simple they're coming in so quickly. Not only that, Bilam being the prophet of the nations, you know, no, it was known that no slave was able to escape from Egypt. When he gave, he was the one who advised Paro, as Jay quotes that Gemara always, which he heard, maybe he learned in Dafyomi also, he called it in Dafyomi, that Paro, or that Bilam was the advisor to, to Paro to institute the Shibut, the bondage. And so Paro said, but here we have all these slaves, these Jews, what's going to prevent them from escaping? He created, uh, through witchcraft, an invisible shield around, about, around Egypt that no slave could escape. No slave could escape from Egypt. There was this invisible force around it, and you couldn't break through that force. So when Moshe Rabbeinu fled from Egypt, they were shocked. How was he able to flee from Egypt? Bilam put this force. In fact, no other, no other slave was able to. You have millions of Jews. Nobody could escape. We were locked in. It was like literally being in a, in a prison, a fortified prison. Moshe Rabbeinu escaped. At the end of 210 years, not only did one person escape, millions of people left Egypt. And we'll see later, when Bilam wasn't able to curse the Jews, Bullock started to mock him. He says, originally said, not even one, one Jew could escape. And here, look what we're confronted with. Millions of Jews are our doorstep. And we don't even want to do. So what are you worth? That's what he said to Bilam. Bullock, when he was getting really frustrated, we realized that uh, the, the 10th hour is coming now, or the 12th hour, and it's now or never. Yogur Moav, Mipnei Ha'om Ma'od, Kirafu. So Rashi, what does the meaning of the word Vayogur? Loshin Mora, Guru Lachem. It's a level of fear which totally consumes the person that he's paralyzed. He withdraws, he's totally withdrawn. There's a negative commandment that a Dayan, a judge, it says, Lo Sugurim Meneish. If a Dayan is intimidated, by the defendant, because he's wealthy, he's powerful. The Torah says, Lo You should not be fearful. You should not withhold you who you are for any person. We're not talking about it's nefesh, where it's life threatening. But if you're threatened financially or some other way, the Torah says, if the judge in any way is affected by this, he's in violation of the negative commandment. Lo Seguru, same word. That means you're overwhelmed with a level of fear, and therefore you don't you, you don't function in your capacity as a dayan, as a judge. But yogur, they were so consumed with this fear, they were like paralyzed. To a great degree, kirafu, because they were numerous. But yogurt's more than they Israel. Rashi says, Kotsu the micro You know, Rashi says in a number of places, where do we find this term Katsti Bhayai? Who said Katsti Bhayai? Rivka, when Yaakov fled, when she knew that Asa wanted to kill him, she said to Yitzhak, 
that you have to, I want him to go to my brother because I don't want him to marry the, the daughters of Canaan because Asaph's wives, were they were idolaters. And I'm disgusted with my life. I cannot tolerate it. I mean, she didn't share with Yitzhak who Asaph really was. That the main objective was he should flee because his life was in danger. We find when, the, as much as they, the Egyptians enslaved the Jews, it says the more they enslaved them, the more they afflicted them, the more they proliferated. Then it says, they were disgusted. So Rashi says, when a person reaches a level that he, he feels he has no ability to do anything, you just become disgusted. It's a, it's a level of frustration which totally consumes the person. They didn't know where to turn. There's an expression in Hebrew, kolu kola eitzos. That all solutions have come to an end. There's no longer a solution. We'll see in a moment. Moab and Midian were always warring. They're always at war. Their arch enemy is going back to the time when Avram Avinu had fought the four mighty kings. And the Moab, the elders, Midian had said to the elders of Midian, It's called This congregation will lap to a lach, 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 will lap up our all our area, our region, the way an ox laps the vegetation of a soda, of a field. So Rashi explains when an ox grazes, not only does he eat the vegetation, Due to his saliva, he actually extracts all the nutrients from the ground, then nothing grows there again. After the ox, when an ox grazes, ox is different than a cow. So just as the ox saps every bit, bit of nutrient out of the ground, that's what Hashem, that's what this people are gonna do. They're gonna destroy us at a level, there's not gonna be a trace of our existence. This is the way what Moab is saying to, to Zikne Bijan. At that moment, Mo, Bolak was not originally part of the royalty. He was appointed as the king of Moab because he was the one who was qualified to contend with this issue. Let's see Rashi. Al Zikne Bijan, Valo, Meolam, Hoyusonum Zeze. Moab and Bijan, they were always warring, they hated one another. Ship Nemar, Hamakes Mijan Beste Moav, it's smitten Mijan in the field of Moav, Shbo Mijan Al Moav, Limuchama, Elami Roson, Shall Israel, also shall be named. But because they were fearful of Paul Israel, they made peace. So the Medjish says, What is it in the Alvis do? You know, a person who has herd, who has uh, flocks, you have a sheep dog. What is the value of a sheepdog? The value of sheepdog is that to keep the sheep together, the flock together. What happens if a wolf ap approaches the flock? A dog is no match. At first it barks to try to scare off the wolf, but if the wolf approaches the flock, the dog is no match for a wolf. So what happens? You have few shepherds, they have dogs. So the dogs say, you know, there's an expression, they fight like dogs. Ernie, you heard that expression. They fight like dogs. So the dogs are always fighting, but one dog says to the other, you know something? As much as we fight with one another, but if we don't join forces now, the wolf is going to kill both of us. So therefore we have to join together to deal with the wolf because there's a chance we're able to kill the wolf. But if we're divided, the wolf will kill each one of us. Therefore, though, that's, that's the marshal. That's the allegory. Same thing. Although they were warring, they hated one another. They wanted to destroy one another. They said, unless we come to some level of peace here and join forces, 
Klaus is going to destroy both of us individually. So therefore, maybe jointly we'll be able to destroy them, or at least deflect them. El miyoshel Yisrael, also shown by name, Omaro Mo of Little Eitz of Mijan. Why did he go to Mijan? Came with Shiro as Yisrael, Notzchem Shlokim and Hagolam. The Jews were victorious, not on the conventional level. Something was supernatural. Omro man higam shel yis elu bijin zgadel. The leader of the Jewish people. Where was where was he mentored? Where did he grow up? Where did he spend most of his years? In Midjan. Nishal mehem ma midosa. What exactly is his secret? How could he be midosa? How could he be evaluated? Omro lehem ain kocho elu befiv. His paralyzed in his mouth. It has nothing to do with his physical might. It's his mouth. What he says happens. We're going to come upon him and we're going to have a match, somebody of his, his equal. And that's why what? They went and they commissioned Bilom. Because Bilom, and that's what Bolak said to Bilom, what you bless is blessed and what you curse is cursed. So Bilam, his power lies, lied in his mouth. There's a Rebbein Bachia, there's no Rechaim HaKadosh. When he tries to commission Bilam, he says to him, what you bless is blessed, and what you curse is cursed. Bilam was an evil man. And Rebbein Bachia and the, the Rechaim HaKadosh speaks lengthy of this. From one's bracha to have value, it has to come from a source of Kedusha. There was no, no, there wasn't a trace of Kedusha in this man. He personified evil. So why did Bullock say, what you bless is blessed? Because if you, he would only say, what you curse is cursed, it would be an insult. So to flatter him, he had to say, what you bless is blessed. But factually, his blessing was worthless. And the Rechaim Kodesh says, the blessing of Bilam was no better than Birchas Chamor, those are his words. Birchas Chamor, the blessing of a donkey. So the Medjur says, how did Bilam give brachos? Of course, but since Bilam was a sorcerer, and he also was an astrologer, he knew what was coming down the pike. So if a person would come to him for a blessing, knowing exactly what was going to happen, he says, you know, tomorrow you're going to become wealthy. Tomorrow you're going to rise to power. But what he's telling him, not, it wasn't his blessing. He pretended as if it was, but it wasn't. It's because he knew the reality, because he, he, foresaw, he foretold the future, knowing the zodiac and through witchcraft, he knew certain things. But people thought the man is a source of blessing, but he had no relevance to blessing. Because blessing cannot come from a person who's evil. Just want to point out something. Just thought of it while I'm talking. The Rechaim HaKadosh says that the Broch of Bilam was no better than Birchas Chamor. A donkey. If a donkey curses you, or blesses you, which is value. But we said many times, in the name of the Maral, and, or, and the Nefesh Chaim speaks about this. What is the meaning? We, we said Yecheskel identifies nations by classifying as animals. Yecheskel Novi says, who are the Egyptians? Besar Chamor and Besorum. The flesh of donkeys is their flesh. The Egyptians like donkeys. So the Maral of Prague asks, Egypt was the most advanced civilization. What do we like? Donkeys. So he goes to explain in the Gurus Hashem that the word Chamor comes from the word Chomer. Chomer is material, physical. Of all the 70 root nations, the nation that had the least relevance to spirituality were the Egyptians. So therefore, how do you quantify them? They were chamor. They were chomer. Comes the word chomer. They were the most mundane and physical of all the nations. And that's why at length he speaks about why we had to experience the Sheba Mitzrayim and Mitzrayim. We had to be exposed to the lowest of the low and only from there we're able to rise to what which we had risen to. This is the morale of Prague. So he says... We mentioned many times in the name of Maral that brocha is what is a spiritual concept. It's because brocha is what 
has has no limitation. The physical is finite. Chomer is is finite. Spiritual is, is not finite. It's unlimited. Bracha comes from what's from a source of kedusha. So the the Orchab says the bracha of Bilam was no better than birchas chamor. You got it. Bilam had no trace of kedusha in him. That means he has no bracha. There's no no blessing come from him. Whatever comes from him comes from his physicality. If that's the case, he's no better than a donkey. As the donkey represents a totality of physicality. He was a total of that, and therefore his blessing has no greater value than the blessing of a donkey, because to a bracha to have any value, you'd have to have some source of kedusha, which he did not have. Decent. Mar says the other Bovakamo that Rav Kahano is mentioned many times in Shas. Rav Kahano was a, a, a Talmud of Rav. He was the greatest Talmud of Rav. And Rav Kahano was one of the Torah leaders in Bovil. And there was a Jew who was an informer. And the informer is a Rodef. And many Jews, due to his informing to the Persian government, the Persians, they had they were the ones who controlled Bovil at the time. They were the power. Jews were being killed. So Rav Kahano goes... And he summons this Jew who's the foreman. And he, he, he gives him a warning. He says, you realize if you continue on this path, we're going to put you to death. You're going to be put to death because you're a road dave. You're pursuing taking Jews' lives as a result of your informing. So the moment he says this to this person, Rav Kano says to this person, what's going to happen if he continues? He realizes he's leaving to inform on him to the Persian government that he should be killed. The moment Rav Kana notices that, he takes this person and he puts him in a headlock. He breaks his neck, kills him. He kills the former. But because this former was an agent of the Persian government, he became a fugitive. He had to flee above him. The Persians had no... Israel, Israel was not under the jurisdiction of the Persians. So that was like a free zone. So he fled Bovel, he went to Yushalayim. He's walking down the street in Yushalayim, but before he, he fled, because, there's a concept known as Magal Nechol HaLeichayov. If a person has to take a, a Jew's life, it's something not positive. Because he was chosen to take out this road. Leaf. So he made a, a vow that for seven years he would not reveal Public, reveal, in, a, in a public forum, he will not reveal his greatness in Torah. Okay? He co comes to Shalayim. Who does he meet on the street? Rish Lokish. Rish Lokish was the, was the greatest student of Rabbi Yochanan, who was the leading Torah sage in Eretz Yisrael. The author of the, the Yushalmi. And so he meets him and he says, by the way, uh, what's, what, what's the subject matter that, that discussing the base measures today, and he shares with him. He enters into his Torah dialogue with him. Rish Lakish never experienced such an interaction in Torah. He's dazzled by Rav, Rav Kana. What does what Rish Lakish do? Immediately, he runs to Rabbi Yochan and he says, Ari Olomi Bovil. A lion has just descended from Bovil. Okay? And everybody, he's the talk of the town. And Ari has come from above him. So he's invited to the public shear of Rabbi Yochanan. So the way it worked, there were seven rows, rows of students when Rabbi Yochanan would give his public lecture. The first row was the most advanced. And as you went further back, it was less and less. And if you're in the back row, that means you're rated, but you're rated at the lowest level. Okay? At the time, Rabbi Yochanan was nearly 140 years old, Rabbi Yochanan. And but he would sit, he had seven cushions under him, seven pillows. Because otherwise you sit on the ground. He had seven cushions, and Rabbi Yochanan sat on, on top of the seventh cushion. So they put Rav Kana in, in the first row, being the star based on the 
evaluation of of Reb Yochanan of Reish Lokish, and Reb Yochanan puts out a question. And because Rav Kana made a nether that he's not going to reveal who he is, he remains silent. Doesn't say a word. They put him to the next row. He asks another question. Seven times he remains silent. Finally, Rav Kana is sitting in the back row. And he looks like maybe he's a dunce. He's in the back row. So Rav Kana says to himself, the reason why I made a nether not to reveal myself because by suppressing my greatness, nobody knows who I am, that pain will atone for what happened, that I was chosen to kill this informer. The seven rows being demoted, being put back, the level of public embarrassment that I had to suppress my Torah and not respond to where Bjorken had said to me, had asked, and now it's time to reveal myself. So he says to whoever was oversaw the, the protocol there, is I'm ready for the first question. I would like to start over again. The first question which Rabbi Yochanan posed to me, and the, the first one, he goes and he decimates Rabbi Yochanan's position. So when they see Rav, Rav Kana's ability, they pull one pillow out from under Rabbi Yochanan. So now Rabbi Yochanan is sitting on six pillows. Next question, again, same thing. And he repeats this seven times. After seven times, each time they pull a pillow out from, from under Rabbi Yochanan, Rabbi Yochanan is sitting on the, on the ground. He's no longer sitting on pillows. And Rabbi Yochanan was amazed. He's never experienced. Rav Kana outpaced Reish Lokish, who was his closest student. And Rav Kana had a physical defect. His lip had a, had, was misformed. And if you looked at him, it looked like he was smirking. He was smirking. And because Rabbi Yochan was so old, he had very long eyelashes and he couldn't see. And the only way he could see, they had silver tongs as students. They would lick up, lift up his eyelashes. And when they lift up his eyelashes, he was able to look through his eyes. He says, I'd like to look at this special person. And as they lift his eyelashes, he looks at Rav Kana and he notices, he sees Rav Kana smirking. Here he's sitting on the, on the, on the floor. He so-called beat Rabbi Yochanan and he's smirking. It says, Cholesh Daite. He looked at him and Rav Kana died immediately. He died. And they go and they bury Rav Kana in a grave. In a, in a, in a cave. Okay? Afterwards, they say to Rav Yoch, what happened? He says, well, the man was smirking. And therefore it affected me. Therefore he died. They said, explain to him. He wasn't smirking. He has this defect on his lip. He looks like that, but it's not. So Yochanan went to resurrect him. It's more at the end of the end of Bavakama. He goes to the cave. The cave, there's a, a, a viper encircling the mouth of the cave. Rabbi Yochanan can't go into the cave. So Rabbi Yochanan says to the viper, allow the Rebbe to come see his student. The viper doesn't move. Allow the a colleague to come visit his see his colleague. The viper doesn't move. Allow the Talmud, the student, come see his Rebbe. The viper slithers away. He's able to go into the cave and he resurrects Rabbi Yochanan at Rav Kana. Rav Kana is resurrected. It's back to life. So Rabbi Nebuch, he asked a question. It says he looked at him and he died. This is the evil eye. Rabbi Yochanan was pure at a level that we can't fathom his level of purity. You mean Rabbi Yochanan had, said, had such an evil eye that as a result of that, that's why Rabbi Yochanan, that's why Rav Kana died. How's it possible? So he says something profound. He says, Rabbi Yochanan in his life never had a lapse of Torah thought, ever. But when he saw Rav Kana and he believed he was smirking, it affected him and it caused a, a, a lapse of Torah thought. So because Rav Kana was the cause of that lapse of Torah thought, Therefore, Rav Kana deserved to be punished. That's why Rabbi Yochanan died. Rav Kana died. That's it. That's what he says, and that's where he says the point. Ayin Hara comes from a source of evil. So Rabbi Yochanan had no relevance to that. How's it possible? The answer is because he was the cause of this lapse of Torah. Therefore, that's the reason why Hashem took Rav Kana's life.
Okay, Jay, that's it for today. We're starting the halacha.